Your book is Tom's River. Talk about why you chose this New Jersey town that most people outside New Jersey probably don't know about. <laughs> Well, for many years, I was the environmental reporter for Newsday, which is a, a large newspaper that circulates on Long Island in, in New York City. And in, on Long Island in particular, cancer patterns uh, were a, a huge issue for our readers, and I was very interested in what they're interested in is what I'm interested in. And, and, uh, and I thought it was quite fascinating to understand epidemiology, which is a complicated word for a very simple concept, which is patterns of cancer, patterns of disease, and trying to interpret those patterns. It's like a mystery story. So I wrote a lot about that on Long Island, especially about breast cancer, because that was such a huge issue. Uh, but I never really felt like I was getting to the bottom of it, that I was giving readers the kind of core understanding that they needed, also, also because I felt like the really good science wasn't being done on Long Island. But it was being done in this town in New Jersey that I had heard about, Tom's River. And I went down there and wrote a story, and, and I thought it was quite fascinating. I thought the people involved were amazing, including, but not limited to, the Gillicks, who, who, you just, who your viewers just met, and listeners. And I thought, well, if I ever get a chance to really write, get the time to, to write a, a deep book about this fascinating subject of cancer epidemiology, I would look for a great narrative and a great narrative where also great science was being done. And, well, that was Tom's River. So when I went to New York, I finally had that chance. I went to NYU, I finally had that chance. And you talked about, in the book, a chemical plant opening in Tom's River in 1953. Could you tell us about what that plant was, how it was initially received in Tom's River, and how the story unfolded from then? Sure, sure. So Tom's River was really a, a town like uh, any other town. It was a sleepy town down on the Jersey Shore. Uh, the economy was somewhat moribund. So uh, when one of the big Swiss chemical companies, uh, Siba, uh, started looking for a place to relocate their operations, they had gotten into some trouble, environmental trouble, pollution, and also Where? Uh, uh, in Cincinnati, Ohio, mm -hmm. and previously in Basel, their original hometown. I sort of traced that historical. In Switzerland. In Switzerland, yeah. I traced that uh, evolution over time. Basically, everywhere they went, they eventually became a most unwelcome neighbor. But when they came to Tom's River, initially, everyone was thrilled, because this was going to be, or it was, ultimately, one of the largest dye manufacturing plants in the country, one of the larger ones in the world. And then it exp eventually expanded from dyes into plastics uh, and other chemical products. And for many years, it was the most important employer. Uh, uh, in Ocean County. And they weren't, it wasn't just that there were a lot of jobs, they were well paying jobs, good blue collar jobs. So, in some ways, it was a real agent for social mobility, as long as people didn't think too hard about the long term consequences. There was a lot of short term thinking versus coming to grips with the long term. So, SEBA manufactured dye. Could you talk about, which, which you do in the book, what, what are some of the dangers associated with dye manufacturing, which leads to these chemical pollutants, et cetera? Right. Well, it turns out that dyes uh, are fascinating to look at for a couple of reasons. The, the first of which is that all of the big chemical uh, companies that we uh, know and love, uh, st starting uh, with BASF, the largest uh, chemical company in the world, still still around, Ciba, Sandoz, uh, so many uh, uh, GAF, so, so many of the big. Uh, chemical companies started out by manufacturing dyes, which was really the first great product of the chemical age, starting in the 1850s. On the other hand, the thing about making dyes is that it generates a tremendous amount of hazardous waste. I mean, a lot. Uh, in, in Tom's River, I was able to show that it actually generated much more waste than usable product, and all that product had to go somewhere. And traditionally, uh, where they put it was either in the ground or into the water. And that's exactly what they did in Tom's River, too. I mean, this is truly an astounding story. And it's the residents that played a key role in uncovering uh, what was going on. I wanted to turn back to Link TV's Earth Focus um, that did this story to Tom's River resident Linda Gillick, describing the effort she made to uncover the reason why her son Michael and so many other children in the area were getting cancer. I put up a map of the whole county so that we could see where our children were located for our caseworkers. And as the years went on, we noticed that Tom's River had become one 
big, dark area full of pens. It was a big concern. And I did reach out to the State Health Department numerous times and told them of my concerns and was told over and over again that there was not a problem. That was Linda Gillick uh, describing this effort she made to find out what was going on. Um, tell us about Linda and her son, Michael. Well, Linda's a, a fascinating person and uh, a very brave one, and most of all, an extremely determined person. And uh, she was always a very sort of community-minded person. She was involved. She was a school teacher. Uh, and, and was, uh, you know, the kind of person who had a network of friends and always wanted to know what was going on. And her life changed uh, in, a, in a horrible way when Michael was diagnosed with neuroblastoma at three months. And at that time, neuroblastoma was just a, a terrible diagnosis. And, and they, they told Linda that it was uh, less than 50-50 that Michael would reach his first birthday. And, I mean, the Gillicks were so traumatized that they did things like celebrate his first birthday at six months, because they were afraid he wouldn't actually reach his first birthday. And, and they actually purchased a coffin for Michael, because if the time came, they didn't want to have to f make that horrible, f you know, go through that horrible process. Uh, so it was just the most horrible situation that you could possibly imagine. And many people, quite understandably, would have turned inward with their grief. But that is not Linda's way. And, and uh, what happened was she would go with Michael to Sloan Kettering uh, or New York Hospital up in New York or to the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia in Philadelphia and get treatment, because Tom's River was not yet uh, large enough to have an advanced cancer treatment, although there is now. Uh, and wherever she would go, she would bump in—it felt like to her that she would bump into other parents and kids from Tom's River. And she was the kind of person that started keeping track. And it eventually got to the point where, as your viewers and listeners just saw and heard, she made a map. Uh, and it, this is the kind of thing that happens sometimes, not just in Tom's River, but in Woburn, Massachusetts, which people may be familiar with, uh, uh, you know, from, from, from the movie and book Civil Action that John Travolta was in. Uh, but it's not just there. Many places, uh, citizen activists start keeping track of cases. In Linda's case, she was not able to get the attention of the authorities. They told her, "You, sorry, uh, we don't think there's anything there. Things changed uh, only later, uh, thanks to a whole sort of strange uh, series of events centering <coughs> on, on a nurse at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Uh, I, Who? What, what she did, her, her name is... Uh, is Lisa Bernazian, and she was a uh, at the time was a young nurse in the pediatric oncology ward, and she too, as with Linda Gillick, had noticed that there were a lot of people coming to CHOP, as that hospital is called, from Tom's River, and that was really strange because the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia is a very famous institution. It, it attracts children uh, from all over the world and certainly from all over the region, the mid-Atlantic region. So why should there be so many kids from Tom's River? And that, that really bothered her. That, that, that bothered Lisa. She said something to the doctors. The doctors said, you know, just you're, you're a nurse. Go back to being a nurse. Uh, you, you, really, you really don't know what you're talking about here. Uh, it's probably just a coincidence. But it really bothered Lisa. You know, the thing is that when you're a nurse, uh, a dedicated nurse like Lisa, you really get to know the families and their parents. You spend those long shifts uh, overnight. Uh, and when a child dies, you go to the funeral. And she went to a number of funerals in Tom's River. And every time she went, she would drive past the chemical plant and say, oh, that's that place that the families were, were telling me about. So, so what happened was that it turned out that uh, Lisa's uh, sister-in-law worked at the EPA, and she was talking to her sister-in-law about this. <laughs> and her sister-in-law happened to know who to contact uh, in, within the federal government to try to get something going. And then that person, in turn, contacted the state health department, which said, OK, we're actually going to take a look at this. Even that was not the end, because the state health department tried to keep that initial uh, assessment secret. You told us about the Sibagaygi plant. You told us about all the children who were sick in Tom's River getting cancer. What about Union Carbide? Right. Well, 
I want to make sure everybody understands that this story is about a lot more than, than just the chemical plant. Uh, and that is another phenomenon that was happening in New Jersey and other, other places around the country at that time, in the 60s and the 70s, was illegal dumping, that chemical companies were looking for cheap ways to get rid of their waste. And they often used intermediaries to get rid of their waste, so they wouldn't, uh, so their hands wouldn't be on it. And that's what happened in this case. Uh, Union Carbide had uh, thousands of barrels from its, its plant in Bound Brook, New Jersey, that it wanted to get rid of. It didn't want to spend the money to dispose of the waste properly, so it, it engaged with a contractor, uh, a very disreputable guy, who ultimately took those barrels and dumped them in the back of a chicken farm. Thousands uh, of barrels. Thousands of barrels. And, and he, he, there, there, he was so overwhelmed by the work uh, that he would just throw them off the side of his truck, and they would burst into, on the and sandy when was soil. This done? And, that, and, and this over was, how long the period? It was actually over a period of just a few months, but the damage was done. It was in the early 70s, uh, but the damage was done, and, and uh, uh, a whole other area of groundwater contamination. There was the there was a groundwater contamination from the from the chemical plant, which contaminated one set of wells in the 60s. There was a whole other uh, area of groundwater contamination caused by this illegal dumping. And I should say, too, that the, the town's thirst for growth uh, played into this, because they kept drilling wells frantically uh, and pumping those wells beyond their capacity. And, and what they essentially did was slurped up that contamination and distributed it throughout the town because they were pumping those wells so hard. So that's what happened. And, and, and ultimately, to, you know, to sort of tie it back to what was happening with Linda Gillick and other folks in town who thought that there were many kids who were getting cancer, Linda made her map, and, and she thought that it was something in the water. Uh, and she got the state to finally, Lisa Bernaysian, the, the nurse at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, got the state to look into this. But the state did a very sort of primitive calculation that said, OK, is there more childhood cancer there than we would expect? And it turns out, yeah, there was a lot more childhood cancer than, than, than would be expected based on the demographics of New Jersey. But the state health department didn't know what to do with that information. They, 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 they didn't want to do a full-blown investigation. They thought that would scare people, it would be expensive. So they didn't. They kept it quiet. But Linda Gillick and other people found out. Uh, and uh, there was a huge story in the Newark Star-Ledger uh, in uh, 1996, and then uh, all hell broke loose. And, and eventually, uh, a serious uh, piece of environmental epidemiology, a case control study, was done. And it concluded that there were indeed relationships between environmental exposures in town and unusually high rates of childhood cancer. And that's a very unusual thing to be able to to be able to make draw that relationship. So talk about how the families banded together and sued. They didn't actually sue. It was quite fascinating. Uh, I mentioned uh, civil action earlier. So if anybody's read or watched a civil action, you know that the star of that is a guy named Jan Schlickman, an attorney. He's quite a character. Uh, and he basically lost his shirt, his suit, all of his money, everything he had uh, pursuing that case in Woburn, Massachusetts. He didn't want to make that mistake again. Uh, he didn't want to have total warfare. He wanted to initiate a kind of a negotiation, uh, out-of-court negotiation. And he was joined in that by some very able uh, attorneys in Philadelphia, Mark Cooker, Esther Berezovsky, and others. And they initiated a very unusual out-of-court process that, that ended with a settlement of value. We don't know the exact amount, but it was certainly over $30 million, well over $30 million, that was divided among 69 families. But the companies, of course, did not admit any kind of liability, because but they don't do that. You're saying around $30 million divided by around 70 families. You're talking about maybe half a million dollars for families, some of that much less. Of course, lawyers get money. Correct. That's exactly right. Uh, it would be hard to say that those families got what, what was appropriate, considering what, what they had gone through. How many children died? You know, it, it really depends on how you define the cluster uh, uh, yeah, over, over time and space. But, you know, you could say as many as 40 or 50 died. Uh, out of the 69, a smaller number. But if you define the cluster— we, one of the amazing things and sad things about Tom's River is that nobody ever really took a comprehensive look at adult cancer. I mean, that's the big picture here that, that you know, maybe we could talk about for a few minutes, and, and that is, it's just a matter of luck that we know what happened in Tom's River. It was a very fluky series of, of, 
of decisions and individual acts of bravery that, that got us to the point where we were able to get a decent epidemiological study done. Most of the time, we have no idea. Uh, and that's the bigger point that I, 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 I wanted to try to make, and that is that we don't really do public health surveillance effectively in this country. You know, we, we spend uh, $80 billion plus uh, the intelligence agencies. That's just the disclosed uh, budget. It doesn't count the undisclosed budget. And uh, they're doing data analysis all the time, allegedly to protect us, you know, from uh, bad guys. Uh, we don't. We collect a tremendous amount of environmental and public health data, and we do nothing with it, uh, almost nothing with it. We don't look for patterns. We don't analyze those patterns. And that is a, a terrible tragedy. We're, people are dying because we do not do effective public health surveillance in this country. And we're operating on laws that are 50 years old. We're uh, using science that is almost always conducted by people with the greatest acts to grind, regulatory science, which is conducted either by the chemical companies themselves or the contractors they hire. We, we, we've got some real systemic problems here, and that was a big reason why I wrote this book.